Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC310, our class on church and ministry administration. Uh, we'll just um, pray and then get started. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to learn. And we ask, Lord, for the work of your spirit, giving us wisdom, understanding, and help us to learn, help us to remember the things we hear, so that in the days to come, Lord, we'll be able to use it in the ministries that you give to us. That we'll be able to do a good work for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Uh, let me just share the uh, PDF that we are using, and uh, then we will go uh, get started. All right. So we were in um, uh, in lesson. What was this lesson? Lesson uh, uh, three, where last week we were talking about church trust governance, forming that entity, and so on. Uh, I will just um, quickly share with you online. Oh, sorry, I didn't. you don't have a printout of this. So uh, some of sample PDFs, I'll put it in Google Classroom, right? so you can download it from there. Um, I'll just share this sample trust deed. Uh, this is just one example online. I'm sharing it in Google Classroom. Uh, where um you can so this uh, this is not necessarily the only way to do it this one example what we used for apc so basically you know you'll have your trustees you mention the names of the trustees and the trustee and um, then you'll have uh, you know you put a little money in to get the in the trust fund to get things started any amount and then you list out all the aims and the objectives of the trust you know so you, you it's a religious trust so that means you're saying very clearly, we are here for the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we want to do all kinds of things. So, the the idea initially in the trust deed, uh, or in you know in some places they call call it the articles of incorporation. That is when you're forming the legal entity, you want to list almost anything and everything that you plan to do. Because even though you may not be actually doing it when you start, you want to put it all in the trustee so that in the future if you decide to do something you should be able to right uh, the trust deed should be as broad and as open rather than being very restrictive because if it is not in the trust deed um, it, it, government can question you how you're doing this it is not in your uh, trust deed of course, we can always make amendments. That means you can add something to your trustee later on in the future in case you you forgot in the beginning. It can be done. You, you can bring in amendments to the trustee. Everybody signs it. But it's better in the beginning itself. You try to have something that's broad, that anything, everything. So this is one example where we we put everything, you know, schools, college, <laughs> books, uh, Bible colleges, whatever we want, seminaries, seminars. We put it all in the trustee, so that saying that in the future we can do all this. Right? Even though at that time we had nothing, it was just you know a handful of people starting. We had nothing, but we put everything here, so that we can work on it. And then what you can do, cannot do with the money. For example, we cannot take the money and invest it in in uh, commercial products. That means you know we can't put it in uh, um, uh, kinds of we can buy land, we can buy buildings. But we can't put it in other kinds of investment. You can keep it in the bank, but you can't, you know, like say, buy mutual funds, these kinds of things. Those are risky. You, if you lose, you're losing people's money. Right? So we say oh, you cannot do those kinds of things. Right? Uh, you can operate anywhere in India and so on. So uh, this obviously is for something for India. Like those of you uh, in the e-learning course, if you're from other parts of the world, you will have articles of incorporation that's relevant for your country. Uh, but this is just an example of how you can have something that uh, covers all of it. So I think this trustee is very good, at least for us. It has helped us do uh, all the things that we are doing. There's been no problems. The only amendments we made is when trustees changed. You know, when people, uh, some people, old people left, moved abroad, and then we added some new people. Okay. 
So yeah, so just wanted to give you that example. Let's go to lesson number four now, where we will talk about church and ministry, organization, structure. So lesson number four. Um, like we said, uh, ministry is a spiritual work, but it has to be organized both in terms of the ministry, that means how the people who are doing the work of the ministry, also in terms of the organization that is supporting the ministry. You, know, you need to organize this. It has to be organized. That means uh, we, we, we call it an organizational structure. How is the ministry organized? What are the different functions, the roles, and the responsibilities? who's making decisions, who's responsible for what, right? So you have to have an organization structure. So that will help us, um, you know, uh, function better and help us serve people better, right? So uh, having an organization structure for the church or the ministry is important. Now, there are many different types of organizational structures. Uh, you can, you know, build something around functions or what we could call as ministries or departments or um, uh, uh, you know different divisions there uh, or you could have yeah oh, so you can also have a divisional structure um, you could you know do something like for example north, north south east west you can by divisions you can do it you can have a flat structure that means okay there's just leader and leaders and teams you know doing the work uh, you can have any kind of a mix, a matrix structure, blending of these things. So uh, you f you'd find you 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 create your organizational structure that is best suited for you, right? and I will explain how to how we work here, and so on. Now, if you look at it from a biblical perspective, uh, and we have shared this already before, uh, how a, a beautiful example is how David, King David set up the tabernacle right so you just follow with me please in in in, uh, in some of these scriptures uh, first chronicle we'll start with first chronicle 23 so david wanted to have a ministry a tabernacle the tabernacle of course was something god gave he told you know david uh, he told moses set up the tabernacle but when david became king his heart's desire was to have uh, prayer and worship and the tab tabernacle functioning all the time. So no, you know, nowadays we have church only on Sundays. But imagine something functioning all the time. No, 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 not stopping. Right? No break. It's always happening. Always happening. How will you do that? Right? How can you have a tabernacle that's running always? And in David's time, it ran for 33 years. Constant, non-stop. You know. So how did he do it? First Chronicle, we just look at a few things, right? Uh, so he set up the tabernacle, and you find how um, he organized things. First Chronicles 23. It says he gathered, verse 2. He I'm just quickly glancing through this, not reading in detail. He all gathered leaders, Levites, and... Uh, he had these people. Now look at the numbers. The number of individual males was 38,000. Of these 24,000 were to look after the work of the house of the Lord. 6,000 were officers and judges. 4,000 were gatekeepers. 4,000 praised the Lord with musical instruments. So you think about this. There were 38,000 people. 24 were doing work. In the tabernacle, twenty-four thousand people doing work in the tabernacle. Is, then there were six thousand who were officers and judges, so they take care of the people and people's problems and taking care of the people, their issues. Then four thousand were gatekeepers; they would, you know, stand around the tabernacle and uh, basically serve outside the tabernacle. And four thousand were what we will call worship team. 4,000 for praising, worshiping God. 
So David had a structure. So he wanted to do something good, which is, I want to have a tabernacle where people will serve God, worship God. But it didn't happen by just everybody do what you want. No. Okay, you people, you do this. You take care of the uh, work of the tabernacle. Serve in the site. You people serve outside. You people, you take care of the public, their needs, be the judges, resolve their problems. And you people, 4,000, you must, you just take care of worship. So he arranged. Okay. So that's how it was functioning. Right? So even today in the ministry, it's good for us to be organized. So this is from that time, David's time. Where things are just all set in place and organized. We can see a little bit more, chapter 25, um, he, uh, verses 1 to 8. Uh, Moreover, David and the cap captains of the army separated for the service some of the sons of Asa. So now we're going into the musicians' detail. So we know there were 4,000 people given for to designate to take care of music. Now, what's happening within them? They are the sons of Asaph who would prophesy with harp, stringed instruments, and cymbals. Um, and of the sons of Asaph, uh, under the direction of Asaph, they prophesied. And then you have different groups, different directions, uh, groups like this of the uh, of Jeduthun. He had his group, and uh, they also prophesied with the harp. And of Haman, this was for uh, they also prophesied. All these were the sons of him and the king see yeah. and uh, uh, they were all you know so basically under the musicians there were Asaph, Jeduthun and Haman it's like three groups and they had all their like you know we would call them team members or their people serving under them you know so 4,000 musicians but then there were three main leaders or groupings Asaph, Jeduthun, Haman and they all were serving under the authority of the king. And uh, look at verse 8, verse Chronicles 28. They cast lots for their duty, the small as well as the great, the teacher with the student. So they all had, no, we would call them rosters. <laughs> they all had roster. So there they put lots. Okay, you, you are doing this, you are doing this. Here. But we will say roster. Okay, this is when you are given your time slot, you come. You lead worship, and uh, you do that. So even within the music, 4,000 musicians, there were smaller groups, and they were all organized. You know, who will do, who will lead worship, who will prophesy. Others were, other people are playing instruments, supporting them, and so on. So uh, you can read all the details here, and we're just giving an overview that how in the tabernacle it was so organized. You know, it wasn't random. Just do what you want. Right. You can see it also in chapter 28, verses uh, 11, 12, and 19, First Chronicles 28. So this is when uh, David is now, It is so the, the tabernacle is going on. Now they're coming to the point where they want to build the temple, so physical structure. The tabernacle was a tent. Now David is very old. He's handing off to Solomon, and he has in his heart to build the temple, physical building. And here also you see, it says, David gave his son Solomon the plans for the vestibule, its houses, its treasuries, its upper chambers, inner chambers, place of the mercy seat, the plans for all that he had by the spirit of the courts of the house of the Lord, of all the chambers, treasuries, and so on. And, um, and, and how it should be done. You know, uh, verse 13, the division of the priests, the Levites, for the work of the service of the house of the Lord and the articles he gave. He gave, he gave Solomon a complete plan, how to build the temple, how to, how should the temple function, you know. So you can see here that, uh, and of course David was inspired by the Holy Spirit. It says the Holy Spirit inspired him. Again, verse nineteen, it says, David said, "The Lord made me understand in writing by His hand upon me all the works of these plans." First Chronicles twenty-eight nineteen. So this is just one example of. Tremendous organization, tremendous, you know. 
it's not small. You know, we are organizing 300 people. David was doing 30,000 people organizing, you know, putting them all in place, teams, getting them to do things. So that was in the tabernacle. And then he made preparations even for the temple, how the temple must be built, how the priests must serve in the temple, how they must, you know, all organize. So, and David is saying, he's telling Solomon, 1 Corinthians 20, 19, all this the Holy Spirit gave to me, how to do these things. Okay. So this organization was not just a human effort. It was a Holy Spirit inspired effort. You understand? It? So we shouldn't think, oh, organization, organizing, it's just, you know, our flesh, our human. No, 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 no. Holy Spirit can give you inspiration, exactly tell you how to organize. How to make it happen? How to, you know, so there is a ministry, there is a vision, but how to organize it, Holy Spirit can tell you how to do it. You know, and uh, like in David's, in this case, the tabernacle, then the temple. David is saying, Holy Spirit helped me to plan. Holy Spirit helped me to put all this together. Yeah. So when you think about the church, the local church that you're going to start or the ministry you're going to start, ask the Holy Spirit how to do this, how to put people, who should be there, how to you know make this happen. And he will give you the right ideas. Okay? So let's talk about the practical side here. Why must we have a well-designed organization? Why must you have it? So that responsibilities can be clearly assigned. So example, running the Bible college. I don't interfere with the day-to-day -day things. Right? Okay, I don't know like whether caterer came or not, he gave breakfast today. No, I don't I don't check. Right? It is okay, that is Nancy's responsibility. She, she's principal. Uh, she has two people here helping you, helping her, and then a lot of students are helping her. Okay, you they will take charge. I don't have to worry. I don't ask every day food did food come? <laughs> I don't all these other things. I'm not Thing, you know, okay, that is somebody is given responsibility, they will take care of it. Right? Only if I see something wrong, then I will talk to Nancy. Nancy, this has to be done. This is not being done. Something like that. You know, if I see some. Otherwise, whoever is responsible is handling. They are responsible. They will make the decisions. They will organize, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, to avoid confusion within roles. So if Pastor Nancy is taking care of Bible college, other pastors are taking care of other things. They are not going to interfere here, and uh, you know they are not going to interfere in each other's work. You know, okay, member care. That's Pastor Jay Kumar. Anything under member care, he will handle. Life groups. That's Pastor Paul. Anything under life groups, he will handle. So we, it is not being mixed up. Oh, this person doing it, that person. No, very clear. Okay, so uh, there's no confusion. You know, if somebody sends an email and it has, uh, it is about member care, it will go to Pastor Jake Kumar. If it is about counseling, okay, it will go to Christless Counseling. There's no confusion. Okay? Everybody knows who is taking, doing what work. It will go correctly. And it will uh, we'll also ensure proper coordination among roles and functions, that things can happen very smoothly, like I was explaining. Um, enable communication, sharing of ideas, skills, resources, so uh, communication can happen. Quick decision making, so uh, not all decisions come to me. Whoever is responsible, they make their decisions, they go on. And only if it is something I need to be involved in, they'll ask me. Otherwise. They're making decisions. The pastors, the leaders, whoever is in charge, they will make the decisions. So things will happen very, very fast. Right? They can make this and keep moving. So we can have a very efficient and productive organization. Overall, organization can work efficiently, productively, and it also is a healthy work environment. People enjoy working because uh, it's healthy. Nobody is under overstressed. The load is distributed. Uh, each one is doing their own work, what they are enjoying. It's uh, a healthy work environment, uh, and we avoid stress and conflict. So there are a lot of benefits of having a well-designed 
organization right so it should so if you organize correctly it can function well people will be happy things will work smoothly and uh, obviously we are doing all this to serve people right so for example uh, every day i don't know how many but there will be lots of emails coming in for different things you know like i myself i probably get i mean at least in my inbox every day there will be i think more than 100 emails and i can't read all of them i can't read personal i can't read it but uh, there are people who are handling certain emails so for example sister arti handles all the emails that come to contact right there's somebody who handles emails that come to book requests so every day uh, you know there are so many emails coming people requesting books so that will go to book request so somebody else handles that and that has to go to our warehouse because books are being packed and sent from the warehouse so i am not handling all these emails i cannot for me itself i'm getting more than 100 emails every day i can't sit i can't read it i can't you know i'll be sitting from morning till evening reading emails i can't read them but at least whatever i can delegate 100 emails will still keep coming to me i'll try to catch up slowly but um, uh, these are the emails so example for to contact all kinds of emails come you know and from different parts of the world they'll say we want books we want uh, to how can we use these resources in our church can we use this resource in our conference from everywhere all around the world these emails come or oh, different requests or oh, we want to start apc in africa we want to start <laughs> all the but somebody has to send a reply right so one person is there and at least they will respond they know what to say on behalf of the church they will respond when emails come for book requests it has to be processed i mean uh, we have to say okay if they don't give us the address please give us your address or which books you want because so many books so we have somebody has to check all that then put it in a place where the warehouse will get it then there they will check every day what are the requests coming in then our goal is within two days you pack and send unless it's very big you know we are very big request but if it's a normal some individual requesting within two days pack and send it it might take you know five six days to reach them uh depending on where they are in india but the goal is it should happen smoothly right if they request book request comes it must go otherwise some request comes if somebody doesn't handle it uh they will they say i wrote to apc they didn't bother I asked them for some books they didn't send. People will feel bad. They'll say, this church is, maybe it's, <laughs> they don't care about us or something. And it has happened like that. You know, sometimes some emails or some requests by mistake. You know, if somebody doesn't handle it properly, it can get, um, it will just fall through. Then that person sitting somewhere is feeling bad. Maybe they don't care about me or something you know it's not a nice feeling it could be a mistake from our side but still that person will feel bad you know so that's why we have to be you know have to have a good organization that we can serve the people well you know that we respond because ultimately it is about people being ministered to and uh, so we can serve now some things about the structure and the design of the organization uh, it must be intentional systematic and planned it is, should not be haphazard and driven by internal politics so example uh, we think through what is the best way to organize you know and what is the simplest way to organize i will we'll get into the details how we organize but you have to think what is the simplest way what is the best way to organize for example publication okay we have to send books okay people will send either a letter a whatsapp message phone call or email so requests can come four different ways but 
it is good that one person collects these requests and he put puts it he or she puts it in one place where people in the warehouse can see it right so we don't want four different people handling it'll be too much confusion and uh, it doesn't give enough work for four people one person can handle it so all these requests coming in four different through four different channels go to one person record it then where else they see when their people must be there to pack it but also stock must be there you know so if there is no books they can't send so we have to manage that that we have to say don't let any book go down be below 500 if there is less than 500 immediately ask for reprint the books must be printed that it has printer must be informed print you know so many thousand copies of this title this language send it so stock must be maintained so that we can respond immediately so the people who are managing the warehouse they are responsible for these things now how many people do you need for the warehouse you know initially uh, we didn't have anybody we didn't have warehouse it was all kept somewhere here in bible college somebody should pack and send then as the requests get more then we say no we have to have a warehouse where we keep the books um, now we have two full-time people in the warehouse, actually three people. Right? One person is coordinating everything. There are two people who are doing the packing. So three people are working. Just to make sure that books are going. But in the beginning, we had no dedicated person. Just somebody will pack and send. Slowly, we had to say, no, let us plan how to think, how to do this. And we intentionally grow. Okay? So. The, uh, the, 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 the growth of the organization must be planned, intentional, and you do it in a way that is very efficient so that it can work, work can happen very smoothly. Uh, must be as flat as possible, simple, clear, don't make it complicated. So that is one thing. Don't make it very complicated. Just keep it simple. So, uh, you know, some requests come, it should go, uh, be handled. And continuously improve. So always, we are always looking. How can we do it better? So we get feedback from the congregation. We all ourselves look at how to make it better, right? Because we know we are not perfect. We always ask questions. How can we better, make it better? And it also must be scalable. That means if we want to grow, uh, we handle more. We, we should be able to increase. The design should be that we can um, grow and accommodate more. So these are some things you'll think about uh, when we are designing the organizational structure. So how do you see, how do you test or evaluate if the design is good, of good organization? So some questions we can ask is, is the organizational design aligned to the people that we are serving, the communities we are serving? So are we able to serve the people well? So we have another email ID called prayer. So that is to pray for the needs of the people. So people send email. They can, they can come send email through the church app or just direct email to prayer. Then what, what do we do with it? Somebody collects, somebody has to reply to them. Uh, if they need encouragement, uh, they will send, you know, like some scripture. Like, or if there are resources that can be helpful, they will respond. Then Sometimes if the, pre if the request is emergency, yes, sometimes I'm feeling suicidal, I am, I want to kill, uh, kill something. Sometimes it comes like that, you know, I'm very desperate thing. Then that one, you can't just leave it. Immediately you have to say, hey, um, can we have your phone number? So somebody can call, like from counseling, or we set them up with an appointment for counseling. So even that prayer, we have to handle it because it, it could be sometimes a general prayer or it's something that needs attention. Um, and then they are all put together in a list weekly. It's given to the church office, given to our member care, so they can pray for those requests, you know, weekly pray. So the thing is, whatever we have put in place, we have to ask, 
are we serving the people well everything is it serving the people is it helping them if it's not what is lacking how do we change how do we make it better right um does it help people in the organization add value and contribute so people who are working can they contribute can they find themselves useful can they be useful right um is there alignment between the number three page 11 number three is there alignment between the structure with people's strengths and weaknesses motivation or is it mismatch so you know are people able to really give their best ex uh, exercise all their strengths and you know uh, uh, in a way that they can contribute well are the units departments or ministries are they all functioning well that's number four um does it enable easy interactions and cooperation between departments so number five so we have media team we have it team we have different ministries can they all work together you know because a ministry may need a video done a ministry may need a promotion done uh, uh, a ministry may need you know something done can they work quickly with the media team and it team you know is it easy for them uh, number six is it minimal just what is needed nothing extra as flat without unnecessary hierarchy departments pro meaningless processes that add no value right? so example I've just given one simple example of a meaningless, meaningless steps, right? Suppose person A, uh, she does the work, and she has to send it to B, and B just forwards it to C, and C sends it to D. Then B and C are actually doing meaningless work. They're not adding value to it. You know, just because they may be a manager on one level up, or you send, don't send, you send it to me. Then I will send it next level, and that person will send it to the next level. That actually is meaningless because uh, they're not adding value. I'm just giving a simple example. So might as well say A send it to D, and if you want, copy B and C in it. They can read it, be informed. But if A sends it to D, one, it happens much faster because B and C are not adding value to that email, right? And uh, B and C can be informed. And uh, person B A who actually did the work receives credit for it. You know, it's not like B and C did anything, so they don't need any credit for it. It's person A who did the work; they get the recognition for it. Right. So we need to make this is a simple example, but you know, make sure that the way work is happening is very simple, very streamlined, fast. And those who actually do the work, they get the credit for it, without you know unnecessary people in between. Uh, are you understanding this? Yeah. Okay. Um, another question I'll ask is: um, Are there uh, sufficient checks and balances to have controls and minimize waste? For example, you know, for every uh, for anything that is more than five thousand rupees spending. It has to be approved by me. Like anything less than five thousand, somebody can send it directly to accounts. Uh, accounts will check. Geetu will check. She, she'll say okay, and if it's okay, she'll approve it. Anything more than five thousand, it has to come to me. I will approve. Uh, I will check and approve. Now, for example, when for every event. Uh, other than, I mean, other than weekend schools, like for these events, like the conferences or special things we are doing, so not including weekend schools or workshops, we have a way this happens. Like the ministry leader, the person in charge, uh, tells what needs to be done to our events coordinator, that's Stephen. Right? So they will say, example, we are having marriage and family conference, which happened last weekend. So this will be actually planned one year before, one year in advance. So last year itself, we knew marriage and conference date will happen this year. This is the theme, this is a topic, all that. There's a ministry leaders. So there's three people, Pastor Jay Kumar, Bini, and Jean. They are responsible for that event. So they will share the requirements to Stephen. So, so, but now 
Stephen already knows, marriage and conference, OK. This is the way we need a hall. There'll be round tables, this thing, speakers, this, all that. So he will book the hall, and he will first he'll work a budget okay, for the booking, hall booking, all whatever we need for that event, detailed budget. And he'll send it to me and the ministry leaders. So of course, he's working with them, but he's the one responsible budget, doing the whole thing. Send it to me. I will check. You know, if any expense is unnecessary, I'll say, OK, we don't need that. Take it off. So check. Then I approve. So then it goes to the accounts. So account knows that the budget for this event has been approved. And these are the things money is being spent for. for it's all detailed. So then Stephen can go ahead and uh, spend that money. There's, you know, the vendors, all that, get everything. And the accounts will pay them, pay the vendors. And then after the event is over, we will check again. The bills come in. So there was a budget that was estimated. Event happened. Afterwards, what was the actual? If the act, usually the actual will be matching or sometimes less. Sometimes it could go more. So then we'll ask question: Why this extra? What happened? It has. There have to be a good reason. Oh, we were expecting 90 people, but 100 people came. OK, fine, understand. That's OK. That's a good thing. More people came is a good thing. Uh, fine. So we spent more. That's, that's OK. Uh, but if there is something spent unnecessarily, say, no, this cannot happen again. right? So this process is there, checks and balances, to make sure that there is no wastage of money. Uh, nobody's spending unnecessarily. For example, sometimes people send budget two and a half lakhs. I'll check it. Say, take this off. Take this off. Bring it down. You know, one point eight lakh. So okay, you spend this much. So the person doing the uh, the ministry leader may ask for more things. Then I have to, you know, when it comes to me, I'll say no. Don't waste. Don't waste this. Don't waste that. Take it off. Uh, keep it low. Right. We want to. We don't want to waste money. Right. Uh, so that way. There are checks and balances, so nobody wastes money anywhere. Right? So that was point seven. Um, can we do new things? Number eight. So is the organization structure such that we can do new things? Suppose we have a new idea, we want to do something new, uh, and or if we want to change quickly, can we change? Right? So the structure should be that if you want to do something, we should new, we should be able to do it fast. Yeah. Or if you need to change. We should be able to change fast. Right? So I mean, the, the uh, classic example is during the pandemic, you know, when we had to stop everything, services had to go online. We were able to change fast. right? So in fact, in Bangalore, like we were the first, I mean, uh, we went online, we went online a little later, but we were the first to start online children's church. Yeah? So first to start. So the pandemic happened, everything closed. But we said, OK, let's start online children's church. You know, then other churches followed. So like that, we're able to change very fast. You, know, you can move very quickly and uh, do these things. So these, the organization should be able to accommodate changes or do new things very quickly. Any questions so far? Yes, ask, please. Uh, any questions from online? Go ahead. Oh, sir, is this, it is good or like can we work under others' organizations? Can we, is it good to work under other organizations? So there are benefits. That means if you work under another organization, you can, the benefit is, you know, they have already thought through a lot of organization. They have put a lot of things. So um, you get the benefits that you don't have to, like we say, reinvent the wheel. You don't have to think of all these details again. You can easily take what they're doing and make it part of your church or your ministry. So that's a big benefit. But it can also sometimes become restrictive or meaning burdensome, where um, if the way you want to do ministry is different from way that organization is doing, then you will feel like I don't have freedom 
to do what I want to do. I have to follow, because I'm working under them, I have to follow the way they are doing it. So sometimes you can find that a little uh, restrictive. Or sometimes uh, they may have things like, you know, you have to do it like this. And you say, no, no, I want to do it a different way. If they don't give freedom to do it a different way, then it will unnecessarily become like a burden, or oh, I have to do it like this, you know. So there are benefits of working, uh, like if you're starting a church or a ministry under another organization, there are benefits. But you have to think very carefully, understand how they work, and see if it matches the way you would like to work. That it gives you the freedom. And it actually is a help to you, not a burden to you. you know? So working with another ministry is a help. Go for it. If it becomes a burden, then you know better not. Because then you won't have the freedom to do the things you would like to do. Yeah. Like uh, some organizations are there. Uh, they like uh, give you full freedom. Mm. Yeah, something will be there. You have to report them. Yes. But the way you want to do ministry, yeah. they will tell us like to do your ministry the way you want. But okay. then some so, something will be there like reporting. Sure. So what if pastor like that? It is good. That is a good thing. That's a good thing. So for example, like all our outreach churches, um, we give them full freedom. So we don't interfere with how our outreach churches function. Uh, we supply them. That means we give them all the resources they need. We guide them, uh, but we don't control them. We guide them. We tell them how to do things. They can ask questions, everything. But they're full freedom. But also, they must send a monthly report because we want to know how they are doing. Right? So there is a okay, you know, what is happening in the ministry? A financial report. Uh, how many people are being served? They send it to us every month. And then we also say once a year, you have to come to Bangalore. So we bring them on here so we can meet with them. And then also, like throughout the year, there are people who go and minister. You know, So that kind of relationship we have, but there is full freedom for them to work. So that reporting is a good thing, uh, as long as it is not burdensome. Like, they, you know, like I think last class we talked about uh, where they insist that you have to read so many people or, you know, the numbers, you know, we don't do that. We, we encourage them to grow, serve well, but there's no burden on every month you must have so many people or go to so many houses or, no. You do the ministry as, you know, as good. So. Okay. Any other questions online? Okay. Um, let's see now. Now, um, I'll, just, I'll just mention one and then we'll go for a break and then we'll come back and we'll look at uh, APC's organizational structure. Um, some of the limiting factors, uh, things that uh, could you know be a challenge when we are trying to design our organization. Uh, for example, the, the government regulations. Make sure that, you know, whatever we do, uh, we are following government regulations. And uh, in, in the way we are serving people, the way we organize. You know, for, for one example is uh, water baptism. For example, you know, in Karnataka, I think a couple of years back, um, they came up with this anti-conversion law. Which means suddenly, so before that we were baptizing everybody, whoever wants to believe, follow Jesus, believe you receive Christ, or you're old, you're an adult, baptize. Or if you're below 18, parents give you permission, baptize. But once the anti-conversion law came, we couldn't do that. You can't just baptize anybody. So we have to follow, you know, that you can only baptize people who are from a Christian background. If they're from non-Christian background, you cannot, uh, there is a long procedure you have to follow. You have to get permission, this, that, and all. So we have to be careful now. So in our water baptism application, we have to screen 
we have to ask them we have to explain to them see this is the rule in karnataka anti conversion law because we are here we have to follow that we can't simply baptize it you okay you're a believer you believe in jesus that is all good but when it comes to this we have to follow the rule okay and then we said okay what are we going to do we can't say we can't baptize you so okay tamil nadu does not have anti conversion law so we found a place in tamil nadu so then what we do we take people there i mean those who are from non christian background um so every 3 months or something we'll go to another state and do water baptism for those who are from non christian background and come back so we have to find a solution right because this state has anti conversion law there no we can do that right so we are following government regulations but at the same time we have to see how to serve the people right so both ways everybody is happy uh sometimes there could be limiting factors uh you know uh, because of if trustees are causing problems so it's always good to have trustees who are aligned but if some trustees object to anything that want to do that can cause a problem so these are factors that can prevent the organization from functioning well uh internal problems could be you don't have suitable people or resources or organizational structure or organizational culture could if there's a clash in the culture internal culture or internal politics so for example you know we were doing medical missions we were doing medical we started medical missions in 2012 so we were working with eha which is a uh, uh, it's emmanuel hospital association they have many mission hospitals in north india we started working with them in 2012 but then the work uh came down stopped i think by 2018 or something then last year the current director uh, sent us an email saying hey can you come and help us can you do something you know because they have about 19 hospitals around in north india can you come so we wanted to do it but we lacked a resource i wanted so pass an answers missions coordinator but uh she already has enough work so i didn't want to again add you do all this also so we're looking for a coordinator missions coordinator uh who can handle the responsibility so for a long time and we put the announcement i think and uh, so only like one month back uh shika she joined us as medical missions missions coordinator for both india missions and medical missions so now we started you know okay but it was a long wait we had to wait until somebody is there we find somebody who can do that work uh, she has a background she's been in she's been to all these places so she knows a lot of these things so she is a good qualified person to do it so now we start so now we had call, calls of the ha and um, we are starting the work for medical missions so sometimes what happens is uh, work may we may have to put some work on hold until we find the right person the right resource others we can't do it simply we can't you know just start something so but once the right person comes then the work can get started and we can start serving people okay so let's pause here we'll come back i'll show you how our structure is and uh, we'll take a 10 minute break and come back thank you